I think the pandemic ranks obviously um, hugely on everybody's minds. Um, and I think what's unusual about the pandemic is that it has been obviously, first and foremost, um, it's, a, you know, it's a medical um, issue. In economic terms, it's both a demand and a supply shock, as in it's affected um, obviously all of our lives and that's the demand side of the economy. It's also been hugely disruptive to the supply side if we think about borders having closed. So in my book, The Great Economist, How Their Ideas Can Help Us Today, I look at the past 250 years, really since the Industrial Revolution, and there have been a number of crises, obviously financial crises of 10 years ago comes to mind, um, but having a pandemic um, generate a crisis, recession, um, that's actually fairly unusual on a global basis. In fact, the Spanish flu of 1918 is really the only comparable one. And I think that probably, um, you know, just gives a sense of how unusual um, this time is. Well, there's a lot of, I think, different ideas we can glean uh, from uh, great economists, um, you know, over uh, the past couple of centuries or so, to just help us think through the kinds of policies that are needed uh, to cushion, um, you know, the economic impact um, of this pandemic. So, for instance, um, if we look at how, um, you know, just how devastating it's been for a lot of people's livelihoods. This idea of using uh, furlough schemes, um, you know, income support to support viable businesses, keeping people attached uh, to the labor force, helping them, um, you know, just maintain employment, even though there's been this massive demand shock. A lot of those ideas can be traced to the 1930s. Um, so this is the era of the Keynesian revolution, uh, John Maynard Keynes and uh, some of his uh, disciples like John, John Robinson. They really focused on how um, the classical economists, so this is uh, people who came before them, people like David Ricardo, um, didn't think, I think, enough about how you get the economy back to full employment, uh, to get people back on their feet. So the Keynesian Revolution in the 1930s was predominantly aimed at trying to cushion um, and get uh, the UK economy back after the, um, the Great Depression by focusing on employment by focusing on how government can invest in order uh, to try and just get the economy back to where it was uh, more quickly. And that's where also where you get um, that very well-known saying by Keynes, um, you know, in the long run, we're all dead. And so waiting for the economy to right itself, um, which was the classical economic approach, um, he thought um, probably wasn't enough. So a lot of the criticism um, of the Keynesian approach in the 1930s was the amount of debt um, that governments ended up um, carrying as a result of massive investment, not just in the UK, but also in the United States, uh, for instance, the New Deal. So even though there was investment in infrastructure, um, it was still the case that you would get returns later on. Um, but you would end up with higher debt levels now. So if you fast forward to today, um, there is a similar concern that um, debt levels were already high because debt um, from the financial crisis a decade ago had left us with a fairly highly, um, a higher level um, than obviously we had seen before. So you're starting from a high level and then you're adding more government borrowing on top of that. But where I would see perhaps um, a difference in stress or nuance is that, you know, the 1930s and in fact the 1920s, which was um, building back from the First World War, as well as the Spanish flu of 1918, um, meant that you had this sense of, you hear the term roaring 20s, that wasn't quite what it was really um, in Britain. But you got the sense that there was pent up demand and there was this feeling that um, as economies rebuild, you would get a sense um, that, could, that there's economic growth. We're actually in a period where, yes, you can also have pent up demand. Um, and you do see that with lockdown easing, you see the, the boost in economic activity. But our uh, past decade or so, in fact, even further 
um, before that, has been characterized by a concern over slow growth and slow uh, wage growth. So for instance, in the UK, uh, median wages, um, once you adjust for inflation, hasn't increased really um, for about a decade. In the United States, it hasn't increased since the 1970s. So we're actually in a period where the expectation is growth is too slow. So this context, this difference makes a massive, I think, difference in thinking about what it means to invest. We're also, um, lots of different people have described it in different ways on the cusp of perhaps another digital industrial revolution. So the 21st century world requires different infrastructure than what the 20th century world uh, had given us. So all of those things point to if government were to borrow to invest in, say, digital infrastructure, in human capital, which is one of the key things to make any digital economy work and um, give us that ability to adapt, then you can generate um, growth um, in areas that's unlikely to address both the slow growth context we've come out from, but also position ourselves for what the 21st century world you know, uh, could mean. And it's not just services or e-commerce. It also has effects on, um, you know, what we produce. A lot of manufactured goods, you know, it's hardware as well as software. It's also affected by um, the changes in technology um, as well as um, agriculture. So what that suggests is if government can invest um, in these areas and in people, um, then yes, debt levels will uh, be high. They're already high. Um, but it could generate growth um, in the coming years um, that um, help, uh, help I think, um, us recover from the pandemic um, better. So as with like Mark Twain said, history doesn't repeat itself, but it often rhymes. So I think we can learn lessons from what didn't work so well um, back in the interwar years and think about the ways to, um, you know, to, uh, to do it um, better this time. So my book, The Great Economist, um, focused on an earlier vintage of great economists. And the only great economist um, in the book um, who's still um, alive today is Robert Solo, and he's working in his 90s. So I start with Adam Smith. I go through David Ricardo, John Maynard Keynes, we've discussed, and also a number of great economists from the 20th century. They were selected on the basis that um, they may not have been the first, but they were certainly the ones that came up with the seminal model. So, for instance, David Ricardo um, came up with the theory of international trade that still governs the way that we think about trade, even as that theory has been developed and evolved and changed um, with circumstances, um, you know, since he wrote it in the 19th century. So if I were to look ahead 100 years and apply that same criteria, um, and again, my book is focused on, you know, the big picture, growth, uh, economic systems and development. Uh, the Nobel Prize, the highest prize um, in economics, um, was recently awarded to William Nordhaus for his work on um, incorporating the environment into economic models. So I would see that as, um, you know, a B uh, issue uh, for us for the next century and the great economists um, who develop um, ways in which we can grow in a greener way, in a way that uh, protects the planet um, and fashions policies um, so that you know, we can have a great quality of life and not just the quantity of growth. I see that as you know, one of the major um, uh, you know, uh, determinants of who will be great um, in the next hundred years. Yeah, that was actually one of the uh, most fun parts of writing the book. Um, every book um, is about uh, not just the ideas, but about the great economists um, themselves. And, you know, every chapter uh, focuses on the ideas of a great economist, where those ideas came from, how it's rooted um, in their times, and then um, how that applies to the way that um, we are um, thinking about our big economic challenges um, today. So I would say the similarity that um, I drew across um, these great economists um, was they were all very 
passionate about contributing to the debates of the day. There are, um, you know, economists who work and are very uh, focused on, on their research. But these great economists, um, I think, really contributed to policy debates. So, um, you know, Adam Smith, he wrote uh, The Wealth of Nations in 1776. He timed it to influence the English position on the American independence, <laughs> the War of Independence um, in 1776. Um, David Ricardo, he, lived, he became an, an MP and contributed to the repeal of the Corn Laws, which finally happened after his death in 1846, which saw his theory of comparative advantage uh, win out over the existing uh, theories, which were around really protectionism, mercantilism, the Corn Laws were this protectionist piece of agricultural legislation. And, you know, this continues um, into uh, the 20th century. We talked about Keynes and uh, the work that he did, um, not just in terms of rethinking uh, the role of government um, in, in writing the economy in the short term. He was also influential in developing the Bretton Woods institutions. And this is named after um, the meeting in Bretton Woods, New Hampshire, which um, formed the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank. So essentially the international organizations that are still with us um, today. And then in the post-war period, uh, the great economists, um, I think, were really engaged in what I describe as a battle of ideas. So in the post-war period, there was, um, you know, so I use um, Joseph Schumpeter as the example. He's best known for his theory of creative destruction, which helps us understand, and he studied American massive companies at the turn of the 20th century, as well as the Mitchell stand in Germany. So his theories around how firms innovate and then this Darwinian process of creative destruction, that's what he's best known for in terms of his research, his technical work. But his best known book was probably his 1942 book, and that was called um, Capitalism, Socialism and Democracy. And what he did was he contributed to that battle of ideas of that period where you saw this rise of Marxism, you saw this rise of communism and socialist systems. And those who believed in a capitalist or market-based economy um, like him made the case for how the capitalist system needed reform. He described it like an engine. If you don't maintain the capitalist engine, it could stall or certainly run badly. And that contribution to this, to this debate, because remember the early 20th century um, was the rise of the Soviet Union and that led to the Cold War in the post-war period. China became communist in 1949. There was a real difference in terms of the economic system. And he and other great economists uh, contributed to the, um, to the debates and that eventually led to uh, the welfare state, which we saw emerge in the early 20th century, and I think really took root in the post-war period, which of course in this country gave us the national health system and elsewhere created a welfare system. And, you know, that took a, quite a long time in terms of changing um, the capitalist system, say from the days of Adam Smith around factories and no real social safety net. So the changes in ideas in the late Victorian period, when there was a focus on the deserving poor, on a greater philanthropy, charitable um, causes, all that eventually fed into welfare state capitalism, which is the system that we have today. Um, so the great economists, which um, you know, engaged in those issues, even though, um, taking Joseph Schumpeter as an example, you know, the, um, I'm pretty sure the model in, you would consider the model that he used in that book is probably not as technical as the model for his creative destruction work. Um, however, um, you know, that, that's not a deterrent to engaging with the big issues. And I think that's what characterized um, the great economists um, throughout history. And of course, the other thing I always found, um, you know, hugely interesting when I was writing the book is that they disagreed massively. So you have on the one hand, you know, I already mentioned that Marxism, but just even Keynesianism versus more free market economists like Friedrich Hayek, um, who was writing around the same time as so Joseph Schumpeter and his ideas around the free market not only influenced those behind the Iron Curtain, that was also linked to Thatcherism and the Reagan revolution of the 1980s. So you have this battle of ideas um, 
you know, even between economists who are all working generally towards reforming the market-based economy, the capitalist system, but from very different approaches. And, you know, history proves them right for a period, wrong for a period. <laughs> and we're still looking at, um, you know, what has, uh, what, what has worked and um, what needs uh, adaptation. And that's where, you know, I sort of conclude the book, which is looking, you know, ahead at some of these issues, some of which we've already touched upon. And, um, and thinking about how we can learn lessons from what these great economists and, you know, went through and apply it to today. But, you know, we're able to, to pick and choose because they've left such a rich um, legacy. The other thing I would say is, you know, um, the biographies are probably some of my favorite parts of writing the book because they just led such hugely interesting lives, you know, divorces, affairs, <laughs> ambition, uh, you know, it, it just, it, you know, had it all, <laughs> you know. Um, so the great economists are hugely interesting people um, as well as having made a massive impact on, um, you know, on the world. For more debates, talks and interviews, subscribe today to the Institute of Art and Ideas at IAI TV.